Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with your latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the globe. Coming up, what agricultural players were top of the pops with this year's NBR Rich List? John Key's government aims to speed up big mining projects around the country. And a call to arms at a Wellington think tank as the science-based Redet Institute reveals its blueprint to grow our agri-food industry and exports. All this and much, much more coming up, but let's talk money. Joining me today is former chief economist for the BNZ, turned director of financial focus, Murray Weatherston, and editor-in-chief for the National Business Review, Neville Gibson. And Neville, you've just put out the 2012 Rich List. Uh, what can you tell us about that? A lot of foreigners now uh, uh, taking well, up... Well, you're not uh, allowed to use that term, foreigners. Oh, we're not, but I am a foreigner, so I no, am no, allowed no, to use no, it. No, no, they're internationals. Are they internationals? That's more diplomatic, is yes, it? Yes, I've been told this. And yeah, the, yeah. I better be politically correct on this. And wealth is very movable these days. And just as a lot of New Zealanders have gone offshore and become billionaires... I thought it was only just that we recognised some of the billionaires who've made the effort to come to New Zealand and set up businesses or at least spend a lot of money. And, but, and the Russians are leading the charge. Uh, they are the super rich. Tell me more. Well, he's just arrived here and uh, he's spending more than $50 million just to build a house and buy some property. So that makes him qualify for the rich list straight away. So this is Alexander Abramov. Yes, but uh, I doubt whether he's going to move any of his steel steel industry to New Zealand and we've yet to see just how much he's going to uh, be settled in New Zealand but some of the others like James Cameron, Bill Foley and Julian Robertson have been here a lot longer and uh, we thought they're getting due recognition. Uh, when you read the rich list uh, what do you think Murray is this uh, is this good for the economy overall uh, does it mean anything to a guy like you? I actually think it's um, rampant voyeurism um, you know, it's a bit like the women's magazines at the, at the supermarket showing you know what the celebrities are up to. Um, most of these people's lives have nothing to do with the ordinary New Zealander. And all they can do is just you know, sit with a eyes wide open as to you know, how much wealth these people really do have. Let's ask uh, Neville, fair comment? Well, wealth lists have been done around the world and we've been doing this for nearly 30 years, so I don't think there's anything unusual about it. I mean, there's some fair comment there by Murray. It is voyeuristic. It's our biggest selling issue of the year, so I suppose that uh, helps us make a bit of money too. And interesting, a lot of them are agribusiness players. Uh, they were big winners in this year's NBR Rich List. Reporter Benedict Collins has more. <laughs> Agricultural players featured prominently in this year's National Business Review Rich List, and here are a few of them. Recent arrival to the country, James Cameron is not only a movie director, you are not in Kansas anymore, but now also owns more than a thousand hectares of farmland in the wire wrapper. Since coming to New Zealand, Mr Cameron has purchased both sheep and beef and dairy farms in the region, and the NBR says he's worth $900 million. And wannabe Crafer farm owner Sir Michael Fade was valued at 790 million. Sir Michael has other dairy interests and last year bought the 533 hectare Broadlands farm near Taupo. The Tally family has been in the news frequently this year and even had protesters outside their mansion after long running and bitter employment disputes at their AFCO plants. But they make the rich list and are worth $300 million. The National Business Review says the Tallies have every agribusiness option covered with their interests in fish, seafood, vegetables, dairy and meat. And last month's $72,000 fine for dirty dairying won't put much of a dent in the Armour family's bank account. Fonterra director Colin Armour and his wife Dale are worth an estimated $200 million and are also Fonterra's largest supplier. They own a majority shareholding in Dairy Holdings, which runs 58 farms in the South Island with more than 18,000 hectares and 44,000 cows and that's separate to their substantial North Island holdings. Fishing family and thoroughbred horse owners, the Vellas, make the rich list worth $190 million, while electric fence pioneer Sir William Gallagher's family is worth $165 million. And wine continues to be a money spinner, with well-known family names and brands like the Yeelands, Babbage and Delegate, all featuring on the 2012 rich list. For the full list, visit nbr.co.nz. Well, James Cameron now owns 1,000 hectares in the Y Rapper. Uh, what's he worth, Neville? Well, he's just under a billion dollars at 900 million. James Cameron has indicated that he's going to be spending more than half a year here rather than in Hollywood. He's got a whole string of films lined up. He also is a producer of other films. And uh, while he's not directly connected with Peter Jackson, he really likes the way New Zealand 
uh, film industry is set up. So he's going to have a huge impact, I think. And wannabe Crayfar Farm owner Sir Michael Fay, yeah, he's worth big bucks as well. Well, certainly um, it means he might be paying tax back in New Zealand now because uh, living in Switzerland, of course, he was out of the net. But uh, he's identified the dairy industry as New Zealand's main growth industry. And we came up with uh, probably, we think, the largest dairy farmer in New Zealand, the Armors. Yeah, and last year he bought uh, uh, the 533 hectare Broadlands farm near Taupo. Interestingly, he calls himself a farmer on his immigration status when he comes in and out of the country. What do you make of that? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, what else is, is he going to call himself? Rich man? Um, entrepreneur? Uh, merchant banker? I wasn't even aware that they, you know, someone could actually check what you put on your uh, immigration card as you come in. OK, let's talk about the Tally family. Of course, we know that they had a lot of problems uh, uh, with union disputes this year, but they're doing very well, thank you. Well, the Tallies, of course, run a pretty tight ship. They would be uh, putting it mildly, I think. And uh, people who, who make a lot of money in business are not the nicest sort of people to have around necessarily if you're a worker for them. And, and listen, the, they, they, they're, not just about, uh, they're not just about the meat business either. They're quite diversified. Oh, no, no, the tallies have got a very well thought out structure and the way they get, grab control of AFCO is just phenomenal, which means that the rest of the country underestimate these people and they could see real wealth there. That, that was virtually given away to them. And, um, but, that, but that's uh, the shareholders' fault. Not mine. I mean, that company is going to be worth twice as much as it was a couple of years ago. Murray would agree with that, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I've always looked at meat companies as being probably poor investment for uh, public shareholders. Um, you know, the mums and dads and all the rest of it. You know, I can't really think of one that's actually been successful over a long period of time. Uh, the, you know, the meat industry is actually a very um, difficult one because they take on the business risk of... Um, because they, typically they've been buying the product off the farmer and then on selling it, so they you know, certainly take all the market risk. You know, I'm sure if you were just a you know, um, meat processor and you were doing it like a tolling operation, like the, say the kiwi fruit, uh, cool stores and pack houses, you'd make some money. And, but you know, I think a lot of money has been made and lost in um, meat trading over the years by some of the, some of the families. And most of the New Zealand stuff now seems to be in private hands. And what about the wine industry? Because there were some big winners, of course, on the rich list there. Uh, the, the Yeelands, the Babbages, the Delegates. Uh, would you be advising your clients to, uh, to, to get on side with those companies? Well, you know, wine's a pretty in interesting industry. Um, you can go down to the supermarket and buy pretty good wines for, you know, you don't even need the fingers of both hands to, for, for the price of it. Um, I think the key to the, you know, the wine industry where, we, where the New Zealanders want to be is because we're not high volume producers, um, you know, of, of quality wines, um, we, we need to be getting into the markets where we can get a good price uh, for the wine that we're getting. And probably there's not much future in being a bulky exporter of Sauvignon Blanc at two bucks a litre. Let's change topics and talk a little bit about the Redette Institute. Uh, they released a big think tank blueprint for action uh, about ways that we can grow our agri-food uh, business and exports. Uh, this happened in Wellington last week. Uh, yeah, the, the, what did you, what, what yeah, did you make of it? The Institute's based in Palmerston North at Massey University. It's got a lot of scientists in there. I think this, because, you know, the goals that they've uh, outlined in the government's economic strategy are probably too big when you think about it from today. But they're looking at the scientific basis for this and they're saying this is all achievable, but it would take billions of dollars of investment, not just to science and research, but uh, turning all this uh, stuff we produce into uh, functional foods and the, and the high value thing. So basically this shows what can be done and what scientists know is possible. But whether the industry and investors want to do it is another matter altogether. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me to be a pretty tall ask. Uh, they're talking about uh, the real um, uh, value of goods going up by something like 7% per, per year. And probably in agriculture, the two couple of times I can think of when that might have happened in the past was the invention of um, aerial top dressing and probably the more efficient um, rotary cow shed, perhaps. Uh, but, you know, 7% growth a year for 12, you know, 12 years is pretty, um, would be pretty darned impressive. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I've seen enough of these um, think tanks come up and they say set up a committee with all these high-powered people and they sit around and they talk a bit. But at the, at the end of the day, the business is actually being done 
you know, at the shop floor or at the farm or, you know, in a uh, production plant somewhere. And until, you, until those entrepreneurs come through, um, that ain't going to happen. And they're saying by 2025, we could increase food exports to $62 billion, uh, up to 40% of GDP. Th is this wildly optimistic? Well, this is based on the world's population far outgrowing food production around the world. And there's a lot of studies on this, and there's no doubt vast areas of the world, Africa, for example, that uh, basically can't produce enough food, certainly can't export it. But you look at other countries such as Italy, where they're producing a phenomenal amount of food and feeding a population of 40, 50 million as well. So it is possible, and, and Netherlands is the model for it, but uh, whether um, it's possible and whether people want to do it, it's another matter altogether, because it will mean changing the farming model quite a lot and creating more, more Nestle's and not Fonterra's. Coming up after the break, Deera gets the big go-ahead from Parliament. And for Fonterra shareholders, TAF, trading among farmers, moves one step closer to reality. Get your hammer and nails quick. Christchurch's stunning new city vision is unveiled. But at what price? The government's not talking. Meantime, the gap between the pay of CEOs and the people they manage may be getting bigger, according to the latest Business Day survey of pay rates in top-listed companies. So answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How much more were CEOs paid on average than their employees in 2011? The answer when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you how much more were CEOs paid on average than their workers in 2011. CEOs took home 22.5% more pay, up slightly from the year before. The average pay for CEOs was $1.4 million, up from $1.3 million in 2010. That's a 3.3% jump. The average pay for their workers? About $64,000, up just 0.8%. We're back now with Neville Gibson and Murray Weatherston. And Neville, let's talk DIRA. Uh, of course, it's about had its third reading in Parliament now. It's going ahead. This opens up the way for TAF and trading among farmers on the stock exchange. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts? It will be interesting to see the pickup because there's been such strong opposition to it. A lot of farmers, of course, uh, we don't know their debt position, but probably about half of them are in debt and the other half aren't. And um, it could be picked up more quickly than some people think. But trying to put everybody into the same cart, it's probably impossible, but uh, yeah, be watched very closely by those who really want to see proper investment in the dairy industry because it dominates the whole country's economy and the risk is it's become too lopsided. I saw this morning that Andrew Ferrier, the ex-CEO of Fonterra, replaced by Teo Sparings, has now been appointed by the government to chair the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise uh, that, conglomeration. Th that organisation has certainly needed a, a, a bit of change and obviously John Mason was setting it on the right path, but uh, yeah, because I think Andrew Ferry has got a lot more in him. He will have learned a lot, and uh, one hopes that uh, he can see what that organisation really needs to do if New Zealand's to sort of compete with a lot of other countries who are doing a much better job at trade promotion. It's got to be good for agribusiness in this country. He came from, a, you know, he's a Canadian who came from the global sugar industry, right. then spent about 10 years here uh, mastering dairy. Uh, that's got to be good news, don't you think, Murray? It is, but it'll be interesting to see if he can transfer his experience in large enterprises into the, you know, the, the more typical New Zealand exporter, which is really much smaller than you know, being a large international player. So, um, I mean, you, you wouldn't expect the chairman to be you know, doing the work on the ground, but it'll be interesting to see the way that he takes that organisation. What do you think the biggest challenges are when it comes to trade and enterprise for, for this country? What would you be doing if you were uh, uh, sitting at his right hand? Well, I, I actually think the biggest change that could uh, help New Zealand would be getting agricultural protectionism reduced around the world. I mean, that's our huge, big barrier. You know, the, the thing that we're best at is, you know, really grass-fed, you know, agriculture. And the rest of the world won't let our goods in um, at the prices that, that we could provide it. Um, they want to protect all their own domestic farmers for political reasons. Co uh, correct. And I see that in India, the latest round of talks here, I think it's the eighth round of talks, trying to get dairy into India. Uh, they're not right. playing ball. Uh, uh, do you think that Andrew Ferrier is going to be able to change that? No, well, he, he, I'd, I'd be surprised if he was involved in that. That'll be more emphat, I, I would guess. And the... Um, 
Tim Grosser. Uh, but if you have a look... Yeah, but, but maybe it's time for somebody like Andrew, who yeah. knows dairy, to get involved. Well, yeah, maybe. But, but if you look at the track record of all these uh, free trade agreements, you know, the sticking point for New Zealand always is agriculture. The rest of the stuff you know, matters at the margin, but agriculture is the big area that we need to make some breakthroughs. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, as, as we've seen, uh, we're at, what, an all-time high against our dollar, against the euro. Uh, commodity prices continue to fall globally. Uh, it's getting tougher and tougher for our farmers. It certainly is, and it's always been that way. I mean, occasionally the currency moves the other way. Occasionally commodity prices go through the roof. But uh, longer term, if the world population keeps outgrowing, farming production, and that's not necessarily a given, you know, we should be uh, looking forward to being an even bigger food exporter. Now, John Key is signalling that it's time that uh, uh, the way we give out mining grants in this country needs to be speeded up. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, the whole country is against growth. You get that impression, you know, just the a wind farms opposed, you know, tourism developments, just about any kind of development. And the one on the West Coast, I mean, this is almost a no-brainer. I mean, there's coal there to be dug out. Yeah, and we're no... talking about Bathurst, of course. Well, that's the most obvious one, and that's got opposition. These are very small groups. I've got to say, but they can use the courts very effectively. You could say the same about the sale of a few power stations by the government, which again is a pretty, you know, they're not optimum because they're going to be still half owned by the government. That's not the best thing for investors. But 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 certainly talking about Bathurst, I mean, the company is saying it could be worth a billion dollars over the next six years to the New Zealand you, economy. You're talking huge volumes of coal, and we know from Pike River the coal's there. It's got, and the reason that Pike River was done as a rather risky one is because you, you can't do, you know, trying to do open cast mining, which is very safe, is almost impossible, but it's all there. And solid energy, of course, are, are right next door. So it's not as though it's unknown in that area. In fact, that's what the area is basically all it's good for. We see across the ditch, the Australian mining economy apparently is like two two years away from going down the drain. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually say it's going no? down the drain. No, no. I'd look, it's had, it's had some halcyon years the last few years. Um, the the outlook isn't as good for the year ahead as what it was you know, previously. Um, prices are off a bit and the Chinese don't seem to want to be importing so much. But you wouldn't say that their you know, mining sector by any stretch of the imagination was in dire straits. It's still pretty good. It's like, um, it'd be like at the Olympics. If you swam your second best you know, all-time swimming time, you could say, hey, that was slower than what, you know, what your best time was, but it's still better than every other time you've had. And the mining sector's you know, still in pretty you know, reasonable shape. Now, over in Greece, of course, uh, they're going to run out of money in three weeks' time. Uh, is the European Central Bank going to come uh, to the rescue again? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's Band-Aid after Band-Aid. You know, the story just repeats itself, you know, week after week after week after week, you know, and it rotates from country to country. Um, the fundamental problem is still that there's a huge amount of debt, uh, that the countries that have got the huge amount of debt are still running huge government deficits, and therefore, on an annual basis, the debt you know, is really increasing. Um, it's very hard to see you know, what will happen other than this you know, week to week, crisis to crisis. The market gets all um, upset when it's, you know, uh, Spain needs 300 billion um, bailout, etc. Uh, the market will be upset about that, but then suddenly it'll come at the last minute or at the five minutes to midnight, there'll be a solution that puts the 300 billion in and then we'll lurch on to the next crisis. Thanks, gentlemen. Coming up after the break, future proof on the highways and byways of the economic world as our experts point out what's coming up. But first, our primary sector export revenue, including dairy, meat, wool, forestry and seafood for the first quarter of 2012 was down from the same period last year. And not even a solid season for production in the dairy and meat sectors could help. So answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What was our total primary sector export revenue for the first quarter of 2012 compared to 2011? The answer when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what was New Zealand's total primary sector export revenue for the first quarter of 2012 compared to 2011? $8.3 billion compared to $8.5 billion last year. That's a 2.4% drop. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up for our experts? 
But just before we get to that, uh, I raised the specter of Germany, and I was fascinated to discover recently that uh, Germans, for example, aren't big credit card holders or users. Only something like 36% of them have them. 40% uh, don't own their own homes. And if you want to go to an Ikea in Germany, you have to take cash. Uh, this tells us a lot about why they are the biggest economy over there. Well, it's, one, it's a historic conditioning. Um, and the housing market is very, what we'd call, inflexible. People very rarely trade property. So you stay in the one place or keep the house within the family. As far as the money goes, of course, they had hyperinflation in the 1930s. The leading economy, it's the only really large economy in the world that's ever had hyperinflation, where people were carrying around uh, banknotes and wheelbarrows and that sort of thing. Yeah, but so there's it, a but genuine fear of inflation. Yeah. Plus, of course, they had to recover from World War II. And they did it by a miracle. They were the first to adopt real free market type principles long before Britain and um, the United States did. But they did in a different way. In a very successful way. Yeah, and isn't it uh, successful with it? Perhaps places like uh, Greece, uh, France, uh, Spain uh, could look at, take a leaf out of their book. Yeah, but I think the German thing probably came out of absolute crisis. And, you know, quite often you get transformational or revolutionary change because you're in crisis. You know, the Germans had their hyperinflation, as Neville said. They got beaten in the war. They got beaten up pretty badly. Um, you know, their industry got destroyed and all the rest of it. They were really starting from ground zero. Um, you know, in, in Greece, in Spain... But know, yeah, yeah, but isn't, isn't the Eurozone, all those countries, aren't they in crisis now? Well, yeah, but it, it hasn't sheeted home yet because nobody's defaulted, right? And, and there's, always, there's always been somebody, you know, prepared to come in at the last minute to... Uh, stop the worst happening. This week, uh, we had the unveiling of the new Centre for Christchurch. Uh, uh, lots of champagne flowing. What do you make of it? Well, you know, it's interesting that what got destroyed took, you know, what, 150 years to build up. And now they're trying probably over 10 years to, you know, go back with a clean sheet of paper and say, let's, let's start again and let's build a new city or a new central city in you know, 10 years. It's a, you know, it's going to be a very um, expensive exercise. Um, I think resources are going to be short. It'll be interesting to see once they do get underway uh, where the shortages come with respect to manpower and the, you know, the building industry and the construction industry and all the rest of it. They had 100 days to come up with the program. You know, you'd, you'd think that something that's going to be there for 200, 300, 400 years, uh, you'd give yourself more than 100 days to do. But of course the government is in this terrible situation where they have to be seen to be doing something and you know the patience of the people of Christchurch is going to wear, you know, wear out. It's pretty thin now, but it will wear out eventually. But meantime, uh, there are plenty of people living in the suburbs saying, gee, uh, uh, in 100 days they were able to figure out what to do in the centre of the city, although the government's not saying how they're going to pay for it. But out in the suburbs, we're still struggling. Uh, do they have a fair complaint? Well, I think so, but um, you can't, you've got to do both. I mean, this new central city is basically uh, the, the circus is part of bread and circuses. It's going to have convention centres and stuff. There's nothing, no room there for businesses. So it's going to be interesting that you put all of those facilities into one small area and call that the new city, whether that's the new city of the future or not, or whether it's about uh, building up better suburbs and... Uh, you know, building more businesses is another matter. OK, meantime, let's talk about something great, the Olympics. Uh, uh, they're spending billions on that, of course, uh, uh, the UK government. Do. And they always do, and every government does. But we won a medal. That's, uh, that's right. uh, Mark Todd and the team uh, in eventing. Uh, we get a bronze first medal. Uh, we're going to get more? Well, it was the team's event. Uh, poor Mark Todd just missed out on, you know, on the individual bronze. Um, yeah, it's good news to get a bronze. Um, but I think the expectation is that we are supposed to win you know, 10 or more medals. Um, in the swimming, we haven't done too well. Um, you know, great hopes for the athletics and the rowing. Uh, they're still going underway, but you know, who knows what happens. If New Zealand ever got the chance to have the Olympics, should we go for it? Oh, no, they've got way too expensive. In fact, uh, I think um, the next Olympics, unless it's done by a country like Qatar, I don't see there's a lot of future for it. <laughs> and Qatar, of course, has got the money to get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All <laughs> right, about it. Qatar or bust. Thanks, guys. Thanks to my guests, Murray Weatherston and Neville Gibson. Be sure to check out our website at country99tv.co.nz for the latest updates on rural developments here and abroad. Meantime, way back in 1934, Cole Porter wrote these lyrics. Be like the bluebird who never is blue, for he knows from his upbringing what singing can do. Hey.
stood before the little yellow candle burning there softly looking wide. And I told him how my grandma said it troubled her my soul. Such a fine man was a possible man. And one day I'll see my boy on the day he's finally turned to gold. And we all say goodbye. 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 See you next time.